Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Some of you know I took a quick trip out to San Francisco last week to grab a couple uh, great interviews, and this is the first of those. Most of you know Jason Calacanis from his many high-profile endeavors, such as his podcasts, especially this week in Startups, where actually he hosted us in his studio for this conversation, his launch conference and Inside.com and, and many other things. But older listeners will remember Jason as one of the most colorful personalities of the dot-com era in New York as the publisher of Silicon Alley Reporter. And Jason also played a key role in forming the modern media landscape as the founder of Weblogs, Inc. We talk about all of that and much, much more, including how he's such a nice guy these days, in this fantastic conversation with Jason Calacanis. Jason Calacanis, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. It is a pleasure to finally be on. You've done 150 episodes. 120. 120. Or you're 120, I think. I guess I'm 120. So I, were you either didn't know who I was, or did so many people mention me that I'm on, or did you want to warm up your interview skills for the first 100 with people who are not important? I am a, a one-man band. Ah. So I take them as they come. Got it. All right. Fair so, enough. So I, I kid, of course. Right, right, right. But you know what? I just want to tell you, it's really good. I. I listened to three or four episodes. Oh, cool. Absolutely fantastic. My favorite was Joel from Gizmodo talking mm-hmm, about mm-hmm. how I gave him PTSD. <laughs> right, I remember, That was yeah. absolutely fantastic. I mean, I don't, I'm such a nice guy now, but I used to be so hardcore, and I used to give people PTSD, and now I don't. He seems to be a very sensitive man, so. I had no idea. <laughs> he worked for Denton. Denton and I were like brawling all the time, but I get, right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, all right, so let's, let's start with your Brooklyn native. So is that where the, the attitude that you're talking about comes from? Well, I was born in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, um, which is uh, pretty far out. It's uh, working yeah. class. It's where Blue Saturday College. Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever yeah. was there, correct. It's where the Verrazano Bridge connects from Staten Island. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're from Staten Island, that's pretty horrible. If you're from Bay Ridge, that's not that horrible. But in the 70s and 80s, You know, being from Brooklyn and into the 90s, actually, being from, yeah, including the 90s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, being from Brooklyn was not cool. You were not a cool person if you lived in Brooklyn. In fact, if you went to Manhattan and you tried to get into a club, and we used Mm -hmm. to go to Peter Gation's clubs like Limelight or the Tunnel, the Roxy, Mars, Palladium, uh, and you showed them a driver's license with Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. they would hand it back to you and say, no B and T. Do you know what that stands for? Bridge and tunnel, yes. Bridge and tunnel, which means you came through a tunnel or a bridge to get to Manhattan. But now I go back, and I'm going to be in New York in two weeks, and everybody's like, hey, come see us in Brooklyn. Come in Brooklyn. Come to Brooklyn. I'm like, so I leave, and it gets cool. Okay, (laughs) that's noted. So your uh, your dad was a restaurateur, a bar owner? He was a bartender who then had his own bars. Uh So he had two bars in the 70s and in the 80s, yeah. Did you work for him? I did every job. Yeah. My dad was a taskmaster, and when I was probably five years old, I had my first job, which was after school, after first grade. We would go, my two brothers and I, one older, one younger, we'd polish the silverware. Mm. He'd give us like three bucks, a dollar each, mm-hmm. and we'd save our money up and buy toy soldiers with that. Uh, but then I was a porter, which meant I came to the bar at 6.30, 7 a.m. Uh, every Friday, every Saturday and Sunday after Friday night and Saturday night, my dad would still be there. He might have had a couple of drinks, and they'd be playing poker or backgammon in the corner, and the sun would come up. I would get there, and we'd mop up uh, the bar. So I literally clean up every beer bottle, wash everything. This is at the age of 10. Hmm. I was in probably fifth or sixth grade, and I'd go with my grandfather, who had the job as well, and uh, we would clean the place up. So that's where I got my work ethic from, and that's where I saw a lot of stuff that a child should not see. Hmm which I think informs a little bit of who I am. Right. Um, you, but this is about the internet. We're getting there. Because <laughs> one more thing about you, uh, you know, foundationally, um, you, you got into martial arts really early on, and that was sure. a big deal for yes. developing who you became, right? Yeah. When I was 15, I was getting kicked out of school. Mm-hmm. I went to Severian High School, and they uh, decided I, in my sophomore year, wasn't going to continue on. And so it was a very cruel kind of thing, because your parents would pay your tuition for the year, and then you would be dead man walking when they decided to kick you out for mm-hmm. the last X number of months. Mm-hmm. And so I was told I was not going to continue. And then a guy named Charlie Fasano, who was a teacher, his first year teacher, but had graduated from Severian High School, 
told the principal, Brother Warren, uh, who was a Severian brother, um, which are kind of like Jesuits. They're kind of mm. hardcore. Those aren't the boxing. That's not the boxing order, right? I don't think they're, they the, box, but they're okay. tough. You're right. I mean, they okay. certainly will smack you around. Uh, and they did in that time era. You know, like literally, uh -huh. I was probably the, the tail end in the 80s was the last chance that the brothers had to smack a kid without getting in trouble. Um, and uh, he said, I think that kid could be something. Um, he's just misguided. Uh, and the brother Warren, who had great respect for Charlie Fasano, because um, he had graduated a year early from both high school and NYU, said, well, if he joins Taekwondo, I'll let him finish out the year, and we'll see if he's any good. So Dr. Fasano now called my mom and said, hey, listen, Jason's going to get thrown out, and da-da-da, but if he joins Taekwondo, he can stay. And so I came home, and my mom said, guess what you're doing? And I said, what? And she goes, you're joining Taekwondo. And then I became a black belt by the time I was a senior. I'm a sixth degree black belt now. I taught for many years in Manhattan. So, people don't know that about me. I keep that very quiet because what I found over time is, you know, when people find out you're a black belt, they immediately would like to find out. If, they want to test they, they want to test that in yeah. this mixed martial arts age. Like, oh, you're a black belt. Great. Let's get in a fight. I'm not. Yeah. I'm 46. Yeah. I'm not. Oh, I'll be 46 in November. But, I'm not but interested in any fighting. The discipline that it, that was important in, in terms of. I. You know, here's the thing. I watched my dad's business get taken by the feds because he didn't pay his taxes. Uh -huh. So I watched my entrepreneurial model get crushed, right? And I then decided, hmm, you know, my dad is a bit of an alcoholic. He lost his business to not paying his taxes. I'm 16, 17 years old. And it put a, a drive in me. You ever see that movie, um, There Will Be Blood? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's probably the closest <laughs> analogy to... So you're saying you're Daniel Plainview. There was a competition in me for a very long time. Yeah. And I think it's pretty apparent to anybody who knew me that I felt it was me against the world. And I was a very competitive person. And I wanted to win. Mm -hmm. And I was an outsider. And I think that defined a large portion of my early career, for better and for worse. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, a lot of people were on the other side of that, so it was worse. But, you know, you, you evolve over time. We're, we're, we're all very dynamic people. People are not static. That's one thing I've learned. So, you know, I, I try not to judge people as much as I used to. I try to not be as much of a samurai, insane warrior as I used to be. I try to be a little bit more of a Jedi these days. So what I want to do before we get into your early career, yeah, because it turns out that about 70% of the audience of this show are, are yeah. kids entering tech today. They love dot-com stories. So sure. if you could, let's set the scene of New York dot-com. Sure. By starting with before the web takes off. Sure. There's a lot of technical artistic people in New York because of the CD-ROM bubble, is that? Yeah. So what happened was in um, the 80s, there were modems, and you could dial up to a bulletin board. So my first computer in 1983 was a PC Junior. And I would dial up on a 300 baud modem, eventually a 1200. It was a Ventel, then a Hayes. And there were these BBSs set up. A lot of them were rich kids in Manhattan. Their parents would get them an extra phone line. Some parents would get them three extra phone lines. And they'd run a bulletin board system. It was a fancy computer, a big PC, XT, AT, eventually bigger computers. And you would put one phone line in. And you would dial up. You'd post some messages. You'd download some stolen software. Then I would dial up. I would have my war dialer on waiting for you to hang up so I could be the next person on right. to get busy signals. We talked about that on Joel's episode, right? Correct. And so then what happened was I became like a sysadmin mm -hmm. uh, or a junior sysop on somebody else's who I'd never met. Uh, eventually, I wound up meeting them. It was just a weird kid from Greenwich Village. But that was, that was bubbling around in New York. The 2600 guys were hanging out in the city bank, city, uh, city group lobby doing what's called phone freaking. I, mm -hmm. I got a little involved with phone freaking. I was involved with a lot of what I'll call um, questionable activities around technology in my earlier days. So my first business, when most people think it was Silicon Valley Reporter, was actually Jason's Hot Tapes. My dad had won a, a copy of The Empire Strikes Back off of a mafiosa guy. A guy owed him like three grand playing backgammon. And the guy said, I got a copy of The Empire Strikes Back for VHS. This is before there were VHS rental stores, but my mm -hmm. dad had a VHS machine. Um, and the guy who owed him money said, listen, I'll, I'll take this Empire Strikes Back tape. I took it, and uh, then I started charging kids to come over to my house and watch The Empire Strikes Back. It was out of theaters. There's no way to watch it. And then I started making copies of it. Mm -hmm. I started selling copies for 20 bucks. Um, that was like my first, one of my first businesses. But the other business was I had a friend, Richard Amalfitano, whose brother uh, was into some other things. And then he had a friend. It was all this craziness. But anyway, 
we used to copy and we'd hack copies of like Chess Master and we'd make copies of Chess Master or other games and there was instructions on these BBSs of how to hack it. You right. just go in, you change some hacks, you have to crimp the floppy disk to right. open it because they would be sealed, um, uh, copy protected with a little, you know, you couldn't write over them. So we would do that and we'd sell them for 10 bucks. So we basically were, and we'd steal floppy disks from stores. I mean, we were doing bad stuff, we were bad kids. But uh, at that time, um, also CD-ROMs had come out and computers started to have a CD player in them. And when that happened, you could put data on it and, you know, things like a company called Voyager was right. doing um, A Hard Day's Night and there were dial-up services like Prodigy and AOL that were getting more and more sophisticated and you didn't have to worry about busy signals and computers started to come with modems in them. They didn't have internet cards yet. Um, and in the early 90s, uh, people like Jamie Levy were running around and NYU had this ITP program, mm -hmm. the Interactive Telecommunications Program, and she had been making uh, IPKs and this is before the internet and web pages, IPKs were interactive press kits. They were floppy disks that you put in your computer and you would see like a little bit of video, a little bit of text, a little bit of words. So this idea that you could mix and have multimedia was going to be the future and then you had dial-up services. So everybody was kind of swarming around these things. And in fact, the first magazine I did was called Cyber Surfer. It lasted for five episodes or issues um, before I got in a fight with the publisher, Starlog over the trademark, because I trademarked the name Cyber Surfer. That was my online handle mm, in the right. 90s. And, well, um, uh, what, what I'm sourcing from yeah. is, I, the, the title eludes me right now, but there's this great oral history of the Silicon Alley Times that you're, you're in, you were a part of. Yeah. Um, and so it, the sense that I got from it was, is that, so everyone's around for this early nascent online stuff and the CD-ROM stuff, and then when the web comes, everyone feels like, oh, we can do it, we can go off on our own and do this. Yeah, there was a dial-up business that was Prodigy, and Josh Harris was doing chat rooms mm -hmm. on Prodigy while he would rent an hour on WEVD 850 or something in New York. It was like a local channel right by Esther Place. He would rent midnight to 2 a.m. It was very innovative. Josh Harris, from, later from Pseudo, he would get paid by the Prodigy people to keep people in the chat room because they were paying $3 per hour to be online. There was no flat rate yet. And then he would have people calling into his inner his regular radio station so he said if you're if you're on prodigy turn on your radio in new york if you're not on prodigy call this number get a disc use this code he would get paid a bounty for that right so it's very clever to mix audio and chat rooms um but that was happening so yes you had people who were in the online camp dial-up services aol and then you over here you had cd roms voyager jamie levy People started to, Mist was a big hit, and right. it was packaged software. So really, technology at that time was about going to stores and experiencing it and buying packaged software. So you go to a store, you'd buy something. But when the internet came out and we started to have web browsers, I was at Sony and I was working there, um, and they didn't know what to make of the internet. So they made a Sony website with the Sony logo, and they brought me to some meetings, and they said, hey, this person put up all the Billy Joel album covers and they put the track listings, um, and we got to figure out what to do about this. And they went around the table, and one person was like, well, we could sue them, or this person was like, well, we can do this, and this person do this, and, and then I said, well, why don't we hire them? And everybody around the table got totally silent, all the lawyers, whatever, and it, then all of a sudden, they just were like, ah, forget this kid, you know, da, da, da. and then, of course, years later, you know, they started to embrace it. So. Yeah, the, the you know Razorfish started doing little experiments online. The blue dot the blue was dot, one, right, yeah. and it bounced the blue dot around. That was notable because nobody had figured out how to make animation yet. And you got to remember the the web browsers at the time they didn't have background colors. It was one font. You could make text flash or do other stupid stuff, but you know it was very nascent. Yeah. Um, and then people started to build companies around that. Right. So uh, let's yeah. let's let's set that also. Um, because it's New York, because Madison Avenue's there, a lot of the early, at least in Silicon Alley companies, are essentially advertising, become advertising or creative companies yeah. like that. Well, you had media companies, magazines. Mm -hmm. You had news organizations, newspapers. You ha and you had Madison Avenue, you had Wall Street. So those were the sort of primordial mm -hmm. you know, thing that this was all. But you also had art, right? And the downtown art scene was very, very, you know, it was amazing at the time, and people forget this, but my first real job as a writer was writing for a paper magazine. And paper magazine was very avant-garde, and they actually understood that the internet was going to be something, and I ran into 
David Hershkovitz at a party downtown at Barney's when there was a Barney's on like 18th and I think it was 6th. I don't, the downtown Barney's isn't there anymore, I don't think, but they were having some sort of party. I ran into him, I talked to him, told him how much I love the magazine. And he's like, yeah, I'm putting the internet on my computer. So I went and I helped him, you know, I kind of taught him a little bit about the internet and mm -hmm. then they gave me my own little column called Cyber Surfer Silicon Alley. And so, it was silly, S-I-L-L-Y. And it was just me goofing, like almost like a Michael Musto kind of thing, just talking about the people who were doing it. Ed, because there's Bennett a scene that's developing here because there, there's meetups. It was quite a scene. And, yeah, okay. So like, it's all these people that are all excited about what the web can be and are already doing all this multimedia stuff. And so you start attending these parties and these... I started throwing them too. Right. So one of the first parties, uh, Nicholas Butterworth and I, when he had SonicNet, and mm -hmm. uh, we hosted a party together. It was just mm -hmm. thousands of people started to show up at these things just to see what the internet was. Josh Harris would have parties at 600 Broadway on the corner there where um, his pseudo studio was. And I was a kid from Brooklyn, and I was still living in Brooklyn at the time, and I would come with my khaki pants and my blue collared shirt. And I would walk into a party with a bunch of models and artists. And, you know, this is that period right after Andy Warhol and Keith Haring and a lot of the really interesting 80s art stuff. Um, so this kind of became like, it sort of segued into that, like where you, you, this was like, oh, this is the natural extension of this, this multimedia stuff and video art. And um, it was kind of crazy. And I was like, I need to get a new wardrobe. I need to like be part of this. So I just went and bought some jeans and black, black jeans, black t-shirt, black shoes, and a black leather jacket. And I wore that for the next 10 years. And then eventually started Silicon Alley Reporter. So that uh, yeah. Silicon Alley Reporter comes out of your experience with paper where essentially you're doing like a gossip column covering this scene? I was covering the people in it and just mentioning some of the technology and then I said to David Hershkowitz, I want to start my own thing. We'll call it Digits and you'll be paper and I'll be Digits and I asked him to be partners and he was like, we're really too busy. We've got a bunch of other things going on but you should totally do it. And then I was like, well, Silicon Alley is what some people were calling this. Like I'd heard the term once or twice. Um, it had, I think before I started using it, one or two people had used it, you know, but it wasn't, it hadn't stuck as a moniker. And I said, I'll, I'll do the Silicon Alley Reporter because when I was young, and it's against the backdrop of our earlier conversation of just being a powerless kid who, you know, watched his dad fail and was now kind of trying to make his way in the world with a lot of fire in his belly, I was obsessed with um, how people became powerful or mm. famous, mm -hmm. but mostly powerful. Mm. Uh, famous, I wasn't super interested in, but I was very interested in power. And so I looked at, I was, I remember I was on St. Mark's Place and I was just looking, uh, I was having coffee and I was in some sort of cafe or something. There was an internet cafe called the Ad Cafe. It might have been there. But I just was looking at news, the magazines and I was wondering like, yeah, wow, David Hershkowitz picks who's on the cover. He put Chloe Savigny on the cover, put, you know, this person on the cover. and That's power. And then I was like, because I was like, well, who are those people on the covers? That's really powerful. I look at Spy Magazine and stuff. But then I was like, wait a second. Being on the cover is one thing, but picking who's on the cover, that's the guy I want to be. I just had this like, crazy idea about power. Like, if I, if I could pick the person on the cover, then I'm the baller guy, right? It makes total sense. Right. At least it, it did to me at the time. So I was like, I got to start my own magazine, and then I'll be the most powerful person. You can be the arbiter of this scene. Correct. Yes. And that's exactly what I became. Right. And then to tweak everybody even more, I had seen, like, the new establishment list or just different lists. And I was like, I will do the Silicon Alley 100. Mm -hmm. And so I had a meeting. Now you remember, I started my own magazine off my credit cards. I had- Okay, all right, all right, let's stop. Let's stop yeah. then. Let's do this. Yeah. Let's do this. So you, you type up a, a first issue, photocopy, go to Kinko's, become friends with the Kinko's guy. Yep. You're, just, you're just a one-man band at the very beginning. Literally, my first investors were American Express and Visa. I went to the Village Printer on 43rd Street um, and Josh Harris was having some sort of party at Roseland where Orbital or Orb was playing. I can't remember which mm, one. But electronic, right. you have to remember, electronic yeah. music had just started. So I was hanging out at like parties with Bjork and Chemical Brothers mm -hmm. because of my paper magazine access. And at this point, the meatpacking district, there was Mars, um, there was Florent, and there was nothing else in the meatpacking district except meatpacking and a printer. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a printing company there. Um, but anyway, I, the, the first issue, I had this revelation that if I got tabloid paper and I flipped it over, it would be eight and a half by 11. But instead of doing it and putting a newsletter like Release 1.0, Esther Dyson, right, right. which was sort of my part of my inspiration, Paper Magazine, Release 1.0. Um, Hollywood yeah. Reporter, maybe because you're a trade, you're, you want to be a trade. A little man. bit. I mean, certainly the reporter came from that. Yeah. Or I was thinking of that. And I said... Um, 
I think um, if I put a full image on the cover, it will change it from a newsletter into the magazine. And so I started to switch the cover to have a full image on it. And I started going around telling people this is a magazine. And people would look at me, and I look at it now, and I realize at the time I was so delusional and clueless. I thought people were fascinated, mm. but now I think they were appalled and or perplexed at this. Or felt sorry for you. Felt sorry for me, like this 24-year-old kid's running around with a little photocopy saying it's a magazine. Well, because we should say the way that you distribute this first issue is you go around yeah. by yourself, uh, go into right. lobbies, yeah. and say, can I put this in the lobby? Yeah, so I went and I dropped it off at Flatiron Partners, at Razorfish, at SonicNet, at Sudo. And I was known for walking around Manhattan with a luggage cart with two or 300 copies of it, literally handing it to people. The other trick I had for distribution, it was a pretty good growth hack at the time, was I had gone to Eureka Joe's, which was a cafe on 5th and 22nd. And you gotta remember, it's like, this is a little bit pre-Starbucks kind of taking over the city. There were right. a lot of like small newsroom cafe, Eureka, you know, Yaffa. There was always like cafe culture in New York. So I would put 10 copies in there. I put 20 copies in Eureka Joe's. I leave and I look around and I look back to see if anybody reads it. And I see the guy come out from the kind of take the 20 issues and throw it in the garbage, which tweaked me, obviously. So I go back and I take the 20 out of the garbage. Mm -hmm. The guy looks at me and I'm just like, it's just my magazine. I'm trying to, it's like, I can't let you do it. Other people, everyone do it. I said, I understand. I, I went back the next day. He wasn't there, the manager. I took the 20 issues. I, there's a stack of Village Voices in there and other magazines. I take it, I put it inside every Village Voice, every other magazine that gets an insert. <laughs> and the first issue, we didn't have newspaper distribution. So I had my designer just scan like Home and Garden or Vanity Fair's barcode mm. and put it on ours. Because mm -hmm. I didn't know how barcodes in magazine mm -hmm. work, but I knew I needed to have a barcode so people could pay for it. So we copied somebody else's barcode, and then we would go into the magazine stores when nobody was looking and put them on the magazine shelves next to George Magazine or Spy, mm -hmm. whatever. We didn't want to get money. We just wanted people to read it. Because you, you got to remember there was a zine movement at this time. Right, right. 2,600 and a bunch of zines from across the country. We're all on a little shelf at Tower Records. Tower Records was a store where they sold CDs <laughs> and albums. <laughs> got to date myself. But there was a little section where you could get 2,600 or other things. So there was a zine culture where if you wanted to get your words out before the web, you just would print up a photocopy and give it to people. So two things. Uh, yeah. Still on this first issue, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Um, number one, in the oral history... People describe, well, we all read it because it was about us. Yeah. But number two, I believe that you had a scoop in there about Microsoft. Yeah, my, in the first episode, Microsoft was going to shut down. Microsoft had a program that Laura Stein was running where they were investing a bunch of money. And we found out that it was going to be canceled or it was going to grow or something. We had some numbers that we got. And people would just give me all kinds of information. So I was sort of like learning how to be a journalist. I, I was a psychology major and a, um, a computer science started as a computer science major, went to psychology. So I didn't have any experience in doing any of this, so I just printed whatever people told me. Mm. And I didn't really have much of a guide map to that. So we printed a couple of rumors and that sort of made us notable. The New York Times picked us up for one of my events for the newsletter. I was on Charlie Rose. People started to pick up on the fact that we had this magazine that was covering it. And it's really one of the great things that if you get there first and mm -hmm. it's an underserviced demographic, you become the standard, right? And we were well, you the become, standard. They think of you as the expert of this niche. I, we were the experts. There were a couple of other little publications at the time at New York. Uh, mm -hmm. was the most notable. It was a weekly email, and I tortured those poor guys, Tom Watson and Jason Trevokas. Nice guys, mm -hmm. real journalists. And I was just more like going at it from a Vanity Fair, Spy Magazine, Rolling Stone. It was more like a Jan Wenner kind of approach to it, which was, you know, I'm going to be it, I'm going to be in it, I'm going to throw the parties, I'm going to be the, you know... Impresario. Impresario, precisely. And so that was the approach I took, and it worked. Well, so I, I told you on Twitter, I went to the library and I looked at their yeah. collection. And so it's fascinating because you can see not only your ambition for the magazine Evolve, although they don't have the first issues. I think they start at like issue 18 or whatever. Oh, really? I'll get um, you the first couple. I but um, <laughs> boxes in my it does start out where it feels more tabloidy, more um, covering a scene, yeah. and then it evolves with the scene to now, listen, we're doing real news, we're covering a yeah, real Yeah, 75 event. people work there, more than half were yeah. journalists. 
we had $12 million in revenue in the top year. Mm -hmm. So it, it grew pretty quickly. Did and you uh, raise any money to do it? Not really, no. Just uh, my friend along. Gordon Gould had, people didn't know this, put a little bit of money in, uh -huh. a couple hundred grand. But that was like in year three or something, and he came to work there, and he had a little bit of money, and he, he put a little bit of money into it. It, didn't, it wouldn't, really didn't change the trajectory at all. We had, Joanne Wilson was doing the sales, who was Fred Wilson's wife. Right. So that was another kind of funny thing. My first gig was reading business plans for Jerry, Colonna, and Fred mm -hmm. Wilson before mm -hmm. they had Flatiron. They had mm -hmm. something called Acme Ventures. So I read a couple of business plans for them. They paid me a thousand bucks to read business plans. One of them was for Beverly Hills Internet, which became uh, GeoCities. GeoCities. Yeah. And another one was The Spot. And so, you know, they were probably in their 30s. I was 20s. And I just read business plans for them. But then I started the magazine. And they're like, this is a little too cozy. And so you should probably pick one. And obviously, I made the wrong decision and went with the magazine instead of being a venture capitalist. This is a total tangent. <laughs> so uh, let's try not to go too far off. But uh, what was the VC scene like in New York? It's it was Jerry and, and Fred. And That's it. Yeah. Okay. That was pretty much it. There really weren't a lot of VCs. Patrick, Alan Patrickoff. There were no angels really. Esther Dyson was the only angel mm -hmm. to speak of. So it was you know super nascent, and most people didn't believe New York would play much of a role in the internet industry. Um, that was wrong. It obviously did. It was a really great confluence of art, technology, you know. But it's gone. It's not the same thing. And it was a very magical moment, you know, in that time period because the world got fascinated with the internet. Because a lot of money was being made um, and things were getting super big, it's very similar to now, except now people kind of expect it and it's like, yeah, well, of course the internet's going to be huge. Like everybody's got a smartphone. But back then people didn't understand it. So there's literally, a, great, a great quote I found from you where you said that before the internet came, the way people thought they would get rich was by winning the lottery. Like this idea of the entrepreneurial culture that we yes. have now did not exist. It didn't exist, yeah. no. I mean, there were like shades of it out here where like, you know, Bill Gates got rich or Larry Ellison and there's a venture capital culture, but it didn't really exist in New York. And the idea that young people in New York City were the most important people for a decade, literally we were the most important people. Like there's no reason for a New Yorker to write a 6,000 word piece about me. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for me to be on Charlie Rose at that time. It's just that the internet was so new. We were on 60 Minutes, it was just crazy. Like the amount of attention we got for this very new thing. And, and it was a very avant-garde you know, art scene where things were very new and people were experimenting, right? And nobody was in it for the money, uh, far from it. People were in it because we just thought the internet and there's a real difference between like Zuckerberg and people like that, and I think the people who started this kind of thing, you know, 10 years before Zuck, which was we looked at the internet as freedom. We looked at it as a way to reach people, to communicate as art, as a way to stick it to the man, as a way to get around the gatekeepers. We thought it was going to change the world in a very positive way to make the more world more just. Truth would be easier to get to. And the man and the gatekeepers would be blown away. Now, a lot of that's true and a lot of it's not true, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting thing. And I, I always, you know, when people say, what is it like? I say, I think it's very analogous to like the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, if you grew up in the 60s and you were part of that counterculture and you were part of that first wave, like you thought you were going to change the world and you did, right? Then maybe they had some major influence in stopping the Vietnam War or whatever. But then it kind of went away. And you have to be able to move on with your life that like, yeah, the 60s are over. Like you can take some lessons from it, but that's why I never stop and look backwards. That's why you don't see me throwing like 10th anniversary or 20th anniversary parties for mm. Silicon Valley Reporter. I don't bring up Silicon Valley Reporter. I don't bring up weblog saying, I never bring up any past victories. I'm well, always looking forward. You know, to extend your analogy after the 60s, you know, in the 70s, you have, you know, um, Led Zeppelin and, you know, crazy parties and things like that. So at the height of Silicon Alley, of the bubble, when you do have the crazy pseudo parties and things like this. And um, and I'm thinking of that 60 Minutes interview with the Razorfish guys where yeah. they're basically railroaded Craig. and like, yeah. right, right. It's like, what do Making you do? Making them look stupid. Right, so the hubris, was there a bit of hubris that came well, at the height of stuff? there was. I mean, and when that 60 Minutes piece happened, I talked to Craig on the phone and I said, Craig, I think the 60 Minutes piece is gonna be a We're talking piece. about Craig Canerick, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I'm show. an investor in Mouth.com, mm -hmm. his company yeah. in Brooklyn, full circle. Right across the street from my office, yeah. There you go. And so I said to Craig, listen, it's going to be a hit piece. The only time 60 Minutes does stuff is it's a hit piece, so just be careful. Like, don't do anything. And he's silent. And I said, did you already tape them? I said, yeah. I said, what did they tape you doing? He's like, driving my 69 convertible Mustang and dyeing my hair blue in the sink. 
And he's like, do you think that's bad? And I was like, no, nah, it's fine. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. So then when I met with them, they were trying to really manipulate me on camera to say crazy stuff. And they got Josh Harris to say crazy right. stuff because that's just like pulling a string. But I took a different approach. I said, I'm going to be the serious guy. Um, and I, they, the, um, the guy was interviewing me. I forgot his name. He just passed, but it was a really cool Probably guy. Bob Safer, maybe? No. Uh, it was Bob Safer. And he says, so you guys are going to crush the, you know, everybody in the world. Says, no, it's going to change the world. He said, well, people look at this, and they see the young people getting this rich this qu quick. You know, they, what, did they, what should they think of it? And I just looked at him, and I said, get used to it. Mm. And he said, but, you know, should, rich, should, should these companies get this big, and people have this much power, and get, make this much money, and that people are becoming worth hundreds of millions of dollars? And I just looked at him, and I said, get used to it. And way, it turned out to be one of the more prescient things I've said, and more accurate things, because if you think about it now, we're very used to now people starting companies and then becoming worth billions of dollars in five, six, seven, eight years, tens of billions of dollars even. Right. Because what I saw very clearly at that time, which I think maybe Bob Safer, you know, all, all these other people probably would would eventually see just maybe six to 18 months after I saw it, was once you give people a broadband connection, they'll never take it away. And I had seen the early statistics about broadband and I had played with broadband connections. And really there was this big jump between not having a a high-speed connection and having it. And watching people struggle on a low-speed connection, then seeing high-speed, it was very clear to me that we would have high-speed mobile phones in our pockets, high-speed connections everywhere. It was obvious because I had seen the early Wi-Fi tests. I had seen Palm. And it was like, there's no doubt that you'll be watching video on your phone. It's, it's obvious to me. This is in 96, 97, 98. So I learned this little technique, which was just eventually assume everything goes 100x. Everything becomes 100 times cheaper. Everything becomes 100 times more powerful. And I just approached every problem I saw like that, that the problems would be uh, sorted out. And that made it very clear. And then I had heard from one of the guys who was working on cable, maybe at Excited Home or whatever. He said, uh, yeah, somebody told us we could take their cable modem away when they rip it from my dead, dying hands. <laughs> And I always stuck with me like, God, if this thing becomes broadband and it becomes global, because we yeah. started to have people from other countries talking to us, um, I just said to myself, well, let's just assume everybody has internet access and everybody has it. Then the marketplace is going to go from tens of millions of people for any one company to billions. Well, that's like 1,000x or 10,000x. So as big as everybody thinks this is, it's going 1,000x. I mean, there were only 5 million people online when we started these companies, and right. there were only one or two million of them were probably broadband. So when you started to see 10 million people on broadband, we're like, if this thing hits 20 or 30 million broadband users, it's game over. I was like, 10, 10 billion, one out, 10 million, yeah, one out, right. one billion. Right, right. So obvious. So before we go to, uh, in the direction of weblogs, yeah. do one more thing for me because yeah. I like people to give me color about the dot-com bubble bursting because I feel like for tech, the tech industry, yeah. it's, like the, it's like the Great Depression was for our grandparents. So do you remember feeling uh oh, the jig might be up. Do you remember a moment? Where well, I, got... I knew it was. I mean, because when I saw companies like The Globe, that was when right. I really knew it. Because The Globe was run by two dopey kids, and one I of met them, them. Who has been on the show? <laughs> but Stephen Patternot? Not that one. The other one. The other one. Yes. So these were really dopey kids. I mean, I don't mean to be, well, you know, like yeah. old Jason 1.0, but they were not impressive, and they were taking this company public for hundreds of millions of dollars, and it was valued at this thing, and I went to a party with them, and I hung out with them, and I was just so underwhelmed, um, and I realized, oh my God, these, these guys are totally in over their head. This is a complete, utter scam. They're you just... felt like they were almost like a front for? I think they were dumb kids who were being manipulated and by older money bankers, behind them, money yeah. people behind them. I think they probably feel that way, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just basically wrote a blog post, like, this whole thing's a scam. Like, Because I, I, at the time, I, I just thought, I always had to be the effort guy, like the candid, blunt person from Brooklyn, and that's how I would accumulate my power, it's just by being the most honest guy in the room and the most connected, right? Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a pretty good strategy because people listened to me, and I met a lot of people because I was always viewed as candid, but that's when I knew it was like a real scam and that there was all these bankers doing crazy stuff. And then I remember Cosmo.com had met with some VCs and the VCs liked their business so much that they decided to shut their VC firm and start Urban Fetch and be a competitor. Right. And I was right. like, okay, this whole thing has changed. Like, we, we should say those are early delivery companies, what we would think of yeah. as, yeah. So Cosmo was a great company. They would basically deliver you whatever you wanted. It was basically movies, right? Before mm -hmm. Netflix, before mm -hmm. broadband, they would just bring you DVDs mm -hmm. within an hour on a bike messenger. 
and you can get Hagen dazs or whatever, and there was free delivery. Then eventually became five dollars, but they would bring in like H and H bagels and the New York Times and whatever you want. It was really great. Um, but then Urban Fetch came and they did everything half price off and free delivery with no minimums, and they would just burn through tons of money. But it was obvious that this was not going to work out. And when you know everything came apart, I had to like let go of. I had to go down from like 80 employees down to like 10 or five, and then 9/11 happened, and we really got a really good perspective on what's important in life. What was very interesting was I had remember there was a book called Digital Hustlers that mm -hmm. came out, mm -hmm. but before that book came out, it was going to be like visionaries. So this publisher had, you know, this kid was coming to interview people, Josh Harris, myself, mm -hmm. a bunch of people. It was like the, the pioneers. That's the oral history book that I've been referring to. Yes, Digital right. Hustlers. Yeah. So Digital Hustlers was supposed to be called like visionary huh, right. pioneers, yeah. like. But then, because the dot-com bubble happened, the publisher called it Hustlers. And I got really offended by it, because then they just changed the whole spin of the book to be like, we're, and I was like, you know what, fuck you guys. Like, I was never a hustler. I didn't get rich off this, and I was never in it for this reason. So I just, a lot of my friends went, and they kind of, Josh went up to an apple orchard in, uh, in upstate New York, Josh Harris from Pseudo. Other people went on vacation. A bunch of people went to Vegas and did drugs. And Other people have told me that it was almost like, especially in New York, that the old media people and it, there was like a sigh of relief like this fad is over for sure yeah for sure it was like fuck these kids thank god yeah. they have no power and i was like you know what fuck you guys i'm going to be twice as strong i'm going to figure this out and that was that fighter in me having watched my dad's business go and then i'm like now i'm faced with the same thing holy shit i'm going to go out of business well because i've said on this show before if you look at the numbers it's not like internet usage declined ever right no no it's and a it continued line. to go up it's a straight line, right. and it's a straight line, and the um, the broadband and people's ability to spend money, all this stuff was just going through the roof. So I knew it wasn't a fraud, but I knew there was fraudulent behavior that had occurred. Um, so to me, that meant double down. It's almost like if you're playing poker, and you're playing perfect poker, and then some joker is getting their money in bad, and you know they suck out on you twice. And you're like, this is incredibly frustrating. This idiot put all his money in with all this, but I have to keep playing with this person. I got to stay at this table because eventually I'm going to win. So I stayed at the table and I, I never took a break. I just mm -hmm. went back to work. Mm -hmm. And I turned Silicon Valley Reporter into Venture Reporter, mm -hmm. started charging people $1,000 a month for access, $1,000 a year for access to it. Wound up selling all that to Dow Jones. My brother Jamie still works at Dow Jones. Mm -hmm. He had worked for me. So I saved the business. I got two years of salary, started Weblogs Inc. because when I had. Uh, Rafat Ali working for me, um, and Shani Jardin from mm -hmm. Boing Boing had been working for me, and Will Leach had been working for right. me. And I watched two of those, after they left me, start blogging. And then Rafat told him, and Bra Rafat had started the blog, paycontent.org, when he was working for me. Right. And he showed it to me. And I sat him down and I said, Rafat, <laughs> blogs are stupid. You're stupid for wasting your time on this, but I'll let you do it on the weekends. See, he said you were very kind, <laughs> but maybe this that's is this is the version of kind. Yes, yes. But I was kind because I didn't fire him when I found out. Mm -hmm. I think is what he probably meant. Like I didn't, because yeah. most bosses at that time would have fired you. It's a different era, right? It's Gen mm -hmm. X. It's mm -hmm. not millennials, and this weird, you know, balance of power that shifted between employers. At the time, employers were god kings, and you were lucky to have a job in New York. And I was probably playing with all like. I think the starting salary at Silicon Airport was 25K, and then you got 30K if you made it six months, and you got 35K. I basically get people 5K more every six months. At the time, Condé Nast was paying people nineteen, twenty thousand mm dollars -hmm. $20,000 a year. You were gonna pay five bucks an hour, quite literally five bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> I said to him, I said, listen, dummy, <laughs> this is never gonna be anything. Um, if you remove an editor from the process, you are going to write about every piece of nonsense. You're never going to have a sounding board. And the idea that you will publish without having somebody read your work is preposterous. You have no idea how to make a headline. Your, your prose is filled with errors. This is an utter embarrassment. He sold it for 30 million bucks, well, 20 and, million bucks. And he says to you, yeah, but that's not the point. No, no, he didn't, he didn't explain it to me. <laughs> I got it because I watched yeah. Shenny, and then I realized, OK, I had read that Rafat was making like, I don't know, six, seven, eight K a month. And I was like, I did the math. I was like, he's making double what he made for me. And I made some mention that he made some quip about doing it in his underwear. And in, you know, to his credit, he studied me pretty 
deeply in how I built the business um, and took notes. And he was very good at being, he was very quiet at first, and now if you look at him, he's, he's got a little of that Jason 1.0 in, which is he just <laughs> says incredibly candid, blunt stuff yeah. about his peers even. Yeah, yeah. And he does not care, and now people are know what Skift is. I'm also an investor in Skift, by the right. way. Anybody who worked for me previously, I invest in their company, mm -hmm. unless they, I fired them. But maybe, even if they fired them, I would probably invest. Um, and Shenny was doing Boing Boing, and I was like, okay, wait a second. People are doing better work without editors or me than they did with me. Something has changed. Mm. I was always a big fan of Bob Dylan, and I kind of based a lot of my approach to my career on Dylan, which was, at the time, I, in my mind, said, this is electric. Folks over, it's electric now. People are not getting why this is powerful, but there's some power here, and there's something beautiful about this. And what it is is- It's an unfiltered voice. Correct. And the unfiltered voice for nine out of 10 writers is a bad idea. But for one in 10, it's the best idea. So it's just a matter of finding the one voice. Now, I wouldn't recommend most writers just go write a blog without an editor. They need an editor. But for Rafat or Shani or Will Leach, obviously they don't need one. And you know, I don't give myself any credit for any of those people's careers. They probably would have been as successful, more successful had they not worked for me. But I was good at identifying talent. I could tell they were going to be talent. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, okay, they're all doing this like little tiny stuff. And this kid, Nick Denton, who's a bit of a wet noodle in my estimation, he's got two blogs. He's got Gawker. I, I, I only knew about Gawker. He's got this Gawker thing. It's kind of like spy magazine light. And Elizabeth is writing it. What if I did business to business blogs? So I talked to my uh, Patrick Ewing's retirement ceremony. I got tickets to Patrick Ewing's retirement when they put his number up on the rafters at the garden so that we'll date it. I took my former CTO at Silicon Airport, Brian Alvey, who I went to high school with, I said, I have an idea. I have two years of salary. I can't pay you, but I can pay something to pay for the writers. I want to write, make 100 blogs, blank.weblogs, Inc. And it'll be, the ink means business. We're right. going to be blogs for business. So wait, let, let, me, let me get on that. You, you want to do 100 because you're looking at Rafat and he's making, let's say, $70,000 a yeah, year. Yeah, I always thought about scaling. As, so it's total scale. So if you can replicate that 100 times, you as a company Correct. will achieve... 700000 a month in revenue, right. $10 million. So I said, we can build... To, I said, these 100 blogs will make 100000 each. It's exactly the math I did with Brian at the game. It'll be a $10 million business. We can sell it for five times. We'll make $50 bucks. We'll mm -hmm. be rich. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still, because I had gotten an offer for maybe $18 million from Alan Meckler to buy Silicon Airport, I didn't take it. Alan Meckler ran internet.com. He was kind of like this like curmudgeonly, sharp-elbowed publisher from Greenwich Connected who was super connected with like the bankers. Um, and he was actually really nice to me, actually. So I, I don't mean to say that in a derogatory way, but I didn't take the money. That was a big mistake in my career. So I said, the next time somebody offers me tens of millions of dollars, because remember, at that time, I had this thing about I need to make a lot of money and be rich, and I need to be powerful. Mm -hmm. And that was my only marching order. I wanted to be powerful and rich. Um, very, and I, also, I wanted to also beat anybody I was in competition with. So I destroyed the At New York guys. I destroyed Alley Cat. I just, just anybody in my way, I just destroyed. And I specifically went after them. Like, I knew the At New York guys were doing this weekly thing, so I launched Silicon Alley Daily. Mm -hmm. Just to fuck with them. Well, let's stop too, because we, we skipped over the, the Silicon Alley 100. Yes. Talk about power. You are making the list. Yeah. So we, I'm sitting there in a meeting, and we had done three or four episodes. I said, we need to make a list of the 100 most powerful people in Silicon Alley. So we sat around. I had like two or three freelance editors. And we got to 50 or 60 people we knew. Mm. So we only had 50 or 60. That was the total number of people working in Silicon Alley. Right. There were only 60. But then, the and we were putting lawyers on the list, right, right. headhunters on the list, PR people on the list. You would never include them, but it was just there's a PR. You know, this lawyer is involved in internet companies. But so so then, we emailed the 60 people and said, "Do you know anybody who's doing anything in Silicon Alley?" And everybody emailed us two people. We got a list together, and we're sitting there and we're trying to figure out like how do we group this? And I said, "We're going to rank it from top to bottom." And they said, "How are we going to rank it?" I said, "I'm going to make a list." And everybody's like. Don't do that. It's too divisive. And Joanne Wilson's like, don't do that. It's too divisive. And I just didn't take anybody's advice at that time, for better or worse. Sometimes it was for better, like this 
situation for worse when I didn't take the money or go national. Joanne Wilson also, is, Fred Wilson's wife was also like, we should be national. It was a big mistake. I wouldn't cover things outside of New York. I just wanted to be focused on New York. Big mistake. I could have built a hundred million dollar business like industry standard. Long story short, I make the list and I start putting, I think Esther Dyson was number one because I thought, well, she kind of inspired me to do this with release 1.0. Oh, that'd be a nice hat tip. Nobody mm -hmm. can argue with that. Putting a woman at the top, angel investor, smart person. This is a very savvy move for me. Then I think I put DoubleClick number two. DoubleClick had like 50 people. Now they've raised the most money. When I met Kevin Ryan and Kevin O'Connor, they were at Poppy Tyson, mm -hmm. which is where DoubleClick was born. It was like a little, you know, they became like, they were figuring out how to make banner ads run. They were actually a rep firm too. They would represent the ads being sold on other people's websites because people had websites but no ad sales team. So I started doing that list. And then I said, I had gotten a phone call one day uh, from Rolling Stone. And I was getting the press were calling me. And I was, you know, this, you know, crazy kid. And my assistant, Linda Miller, had said, did you call back Jan from Rolling Stone? I said, no. You really should call, call him back. Next day, did you call back Jan from Rolling Stone? I said, no, I, I'm kind of busy. I don't have time for like a journalist from Rolling Stone. I, I don't want to do any press right now. I got my own magazine. She goes, no, no, Jason, it's John Wenner. I said, who's John Wenner? Jan is the creator of Rolling Stone. Publisher. I said, what? She said, yeah. I was like, oh, I love Rolling Stone. So I immediately call him. He said, can you come up to my office? I was like, sure. What time? He's like, 2 o'clock. So I run up to his office at 2 o'clock, same day. He's mm -hmm. got this incredible office. He's got my magazine on his desk. And he asked me questions. Hey, do you want to be the president of Rolling Stone? Or what, what are you doing here? And I just started asking him for advice. And he started marking up the magazine. And he taught me how to do a cover. And I said, hey, how do I do a cover on a budget or whatever? And he's like, well, what's your budget? I'm like, I think we're spending like 3000 an issue. He goes, OK, spend 2000 of it on the cover. It's mm -hmm. all that matters is having a great cover. And he called some people on the phone and gave me references to photographers to help me. And one of them was a guy named Frank uh, Michelotta who wound up doing my covers. And we did these amazing covers that were very themed. So we did agency.com guys as men in black. We did um, razor fish. We had Jeff Dosh just holding up a fish and a yeah. knife. Very iconic things. Because again, back to my obsession with power, I was like, well, if I can get these themed things, I could be like Graydon Carter or Kurt Anderson. Right. You know, I, I was just looking at Graydon Carter, Kurt Anderson, and Jan Wenner saying, like, i got to be like those, or Martha Stewart. Just have to be powerful. Just have to be powerful. Got to get that cover going. So we did that. And the list then became incredibly divisive. Right, because, okay. And then everybody returned my phone call. I was going to say, because then if you only have 60, then the strategy should be, the other 40 should be people you want to know. You throw them on the list to, like... Maybe. Anyway, yeah. we, we figured it all well, out. Then I, then I was like, everybody come to my house, mm -hmm. to my loft at the Starrett Lehigh building. I was leaving, living illegally in my loft. And I said, we're having a photo shoot at noon. Everybody come there. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I gave people like 10 days notice. They all showed up. Yeah. And they said, if you don't show up for the photo, you may or may not be in the 100. This is in the year two or whatever. So everybody came together. We took the photo. It was like, wow, this is powerful. And um, it was great because then for the rest of the year, PR people would be lobbying me for their client's position. In fact, I had one girl I had gone on a couple of dates with, and then she started bringing up the Silicon Valley 100, and uh -huh. I realized, oh my God, this girl's not into me. She's working me uh, to get her clients on this list. Well, and towards the end, I think the last one, like Peter Jennings, no, uh, Sam Donaldson. We put Sam Donaldson on because yeah. he was doing a lot of stuff in the internet. Uh -huh. And we started getting all these kind of celebrities. I mean, my life became very surreal. I was hanging out with, like, I was really into public enemy when I was a kid, and then I got to meet Chuck D. Mm -hmm. um, the guys from Led Zeppelin came to one of the Silicon Valley reporters. Sergey Brin's people like lobbied to have Google at one of the Silicon Valley mm. events. So I was like, mm -hmm. fine, we'll have Sergey. I did a fireside chat with him. Uh, Accounting Crows, just like all these like, famous people. Everybody wanted to be involved in the internet, so they would come by our shows and hang out. I became friends with a guy named Jeffrey Epstein, mm -hmm. uh, who's very notable for horrible reasons now. but. Like he would hang out at our events mm -hmm. with Gillen, uh, Maxwell, and just it was like the center of the world, right? I never met Donald, and, you know, but mm. it was truly the center of the world. All right, let's let's bring it back to weblog. So as we said, you you want to you want to scale, you want to go to a hundred, and and how are you picking what the blogs are gonna? I just picked whatever topics were relevant. So I did social science dot weblog sync, Wi-Fi dot weblog sync. Uh, all these things were very interesting topics at the moment. So I just looked at whatever topics were under service. This was always my playbook. And under service topics. Each of those topics, one person is going to do. One person's going to do it. Uh, Sean Bonner did Apple Weblogs mm -hmm. Inc. Then, I, so I had lunch before I announced it 
with Nick Denton. I reached out to him and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing something blogging. We went to have lunch. We had lunch in, down in, um, it's a pretty famous story. We had lunch down in Tribeca, no, in Soho, uh, West Broadway. And um, I, we couldn't be more opposite. Mm. He's a you know gay Brit. I'm a brawler from Brooklyn. Mm. Like, couldn't possibly be. But we were always very attracted to each other in a very like esprit de corps kind of way because we're both outsiders and we're both... I think we're fighting, we're, anti, we're both anti-establishment yeah, right, guys, right. I think, at our hearts. Um, anyway, so after I have this meeting with him and tell him my plans to do business to business, he writes his blog post about how I'm the exact boisterism that blogging doesn't need and I'm everything wrong with blogging. But just remember, at that time, the idea that blogging would be commercialized flew in the face of blogs. Right. They had no ads on them. And the idea of introducing advertising was... This is before AdSense. Way before AdSense. Mm -hmm. In fact, Weblogs Inc. was in the first Q1 report with... Google uh, for AdSense. We were their blog partner in Gadget, and then they had New York Times. So those were the two case studies when mm -hmm. they went public. Um, and so he wrote this like flame. He basically flamed me on his blog, and I was like, that motherfucker. That melon <laughs> but farmer. he's doing to you what you did to your Of course. Yeah, right. Yeah, so well played. Yeah. Right. I finally met somebody who could be a foil. Right. And I think that's why people were so entertained by the two of us fighting, because they were like, they deserve each other. Right. And you look how it's wound up. Mm -hmm. It actually makes sense in a way. Um, so I said, I'm gonna, I, how can I cause maximum damage? Because, you know, I, I, if you get jumped, like, or somebody sucker punches you, you really got to think through, like, a retaliation strategy that definitively ends it, right? So you get sucker punched, somebody's got to wind up in the hospital, right? Somebody winds up in the hospital, somebody else got to wind up in the morgue. Like, it's an escalation kind of issue when somebody bullies you. And so I was like, okay, I have to make this very clear to him that under no circumstances can he ever take a swing at me again. Good on you. You took our confidential lunch and you blew my launch. Like he just put this information out there, everything I told him, like my plans. It was like a confidential lunch. So I called up Shani. I called up a couple people. I was like, uh, I need to like get Elizabeth to leave Gawker. Come work with me and create a Gawker killer. So I tried to convince Elizabeth and she's like, no, I'm going to work at New York Magazine. I said, Elizabeth, this is a terrible idea. Magazines are over. You're the number one blogger in the world. Come with me. I'll give you equity in the blog we create, and I'll buy you a new MacBook. And, again, back to my clueless, like, kind of gauche kind of, like, approach to things at the time. Um, and he's paying you $1,500 a month. I'll pay you 2000 so I'll give you 2000 a new laptop. You can keep it if you stay to work for me for two years, and you'll have equity, and that equity will become worth millions of dollars. She said, no, I'm going to go to New York Magazine. I said, this is the worst idea you could ever do. You're number one at something in the world. Trust me, I've been through this. I was number one in the magazines, you know, with the business with the Silicon Iron Reporter. Right. I became number one. When you're number one, you want to cement that position. Don't bail on blogging. And she bailed on blogging and went to do features. And then Shenny said... You know, Jason, Elizabeth is great. You really want Peter Rojas. And I said, who's that? She said, he's Gizmodo. I was like, oh, the blog about like gadgets, the fetish thing, because fetish was the section in Wired Magazine. Right. I was like, is there really enough information? Out? Is there really enough stories about Palm Pilots and all this other nonsense, Blackberries, to make a blog? I mean, I like it, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's not enough news. She's like, just go talk to him. So I talked to him, and it turned out Nick had promised Peter equity, but reneged on it. And, you know, uh, Denton, as has come out, pre, you know, is, you know, very Machiavellian in his approach um, in terms of pushing the editors to do things that maybe is outside their comfort zone. So he constantly wanted Peter to do things like, you know, sex toys or just other stupid stuff that, you know, Peter was a very serious journalist, you know, and he, wa he had a very particular vision for Gizmodo that was being corrupted by Nick, and then Nick had double-crossed him. So I said, if you come work for me, and I took him to Jewel Baku, which was a sushi place in the East Village that was, and my friend knew the guy who was running it, my friend Barry Wine. I said, can you get me a reservation there? I got an important deal I got to close. So Peter brings Jill Fehrenbacher, who did Inhabitat later, but she was his fiance at the time. Turns out they're vegan. I take them for sushi. So I take the guy from Jewel Baku in the back and said, I know this is crazy, but they're vegan. I'm trying to close this big business. Don't worry about it, Jason. I got it. He goes out, buys vegetables, comes back and makes all this vegetable sushi for them. I said, Peter, 
here's the deal. He's like, I'm in. I was like, great, boom. Um, then Peter's like, I've got to pick the start date. I was like, I can't do it this th week because Denton's out of town. I was like, go tell me more. He says, yeah, he's going down to like hang out with all these celebrities down in Sao Paulo or somewhere in Brazil, whatever. I said, oh, really? Tell me more. He's like, yeah, he's leaving on Sunday or whatever. I said, oh. He's like, yeah, he's got like a noon flight or something. I was going to try to have breakfast with him before, but he's got to leave for the airport at 11. I was like, okay, cancel that. Um, tell him you talked to him when we get back. It's no big deal. He goes, okay. I said, then email him at 1 o'clock that you're resigned. So when he gets off the plane, that's the first thing he sees, and we can just stick it to him and have a big advantage while he's away for two weeks on his first vacation. We did it. Peter did it. Just broke Denton's soul, crushed his soul. And everybody was like, Calican has stole Peter Rojas. And Peter wound up becoming a millionaire. I mean, right. to his credit, he understood that the equity was worth something. And when we sold the company, you know, 18 months after we started it for 30 million bucks, Peter made millions of dollars. Wasn't that blog also always your most successful? You, you, for sure. Right, because you're, you, you, you said, oh, what, who cares well, Peter about taught gadget me to, stuff? But, yeah. but this is right before the dawn of the golden age of gadgets, right? Yeah, so Peter taught me a couple of things that were very important. Number one, he felt that each blog needed to have its own brand. He was correct. So remember how I took nobody's counsel in the first company, Silicon Eye Reporter, and it got me so far? I was determined to evolve, right, when I went into my electric phase, uh, for my folk phase. And he said, that he, he told me a couple things. He said, one, secret to blogging is showing up every day. Two, um, they need to have their own names, and I want my own logo. So I was like, okay, fine. And we paid Jill, his uh, fiance at the time, like 600 bucks to do the Engadget logo, which is an incredibly iconic one. Um, and um, uh, he just wanted editorial controls. So I said, fine, we don't need to be involved in everything. But then we spun out Joystick, Autoblog, Cinematical TV Squad, um, and a bunch of other blogs. Autoblog was the big one. And it turned out Autoblog actually made more money, but mm. Engadget always had the most traffic. Oh, because of the advertising. Yeah, yeah, we got Volvo and some early people yeah. to start. So, um, you know, if, without Peter, it would not have been the success it was. He was, you know, he... he he wasn't exactly a co-founder because Brian, I started the company, mm -hmm. brought Brian in, brought Peter in. But what you learn at, as you go is, I think, he's definitely a co-founder because he was there in the first year, and without him, there would have been no Weblogs, Inc., and it would not have had the exit it had. So I get, I'd say he's probably, after you know, me starting it, it was probably the most important person. Um, and then I was an investor on the board of Gadget, mm -hmm. um, and you know, with Peter, anything, any company Peter starts, I'm the first investor. And as you said, um, you're, the lesson you learned was the next time someone offers you money, you're going to take it. Right. And so AOL offers you money. AOL reaches out a guy named Jim Bankoff, right? Who was a really nerdy SVP, mm -hmm. um, you know, like bad suit, dull as, but really smart. And he had been Ted Leonsis' chief of staff. Now, I knew Ted Leonsis because he spoke at an event with fellow Greeks. We had a friendship. And Jim Bankoff was just passionate about blogs. And he had a vision for AOL, to his credit, that it, they needed to have something after dial-up went away. And content is what he thought it was. And they wanted to invest. And I had lined up um, Jeff Bezos and... Um, Jeff Bezos, Mark Andreessen, and then Mark Cuban was going to re-up because Mark Cuban had put 300K mm -hmm. into Weblogs, Inc. Uh, for 15% of the company uh, or something like that. Yeah, 15%, I think. And then I had met with Jeff Bezos. He was fascinated about Weblogs, Inc. and how we picked domain names. I had a big meeting with him. He was going to put 500K. Mark Andreessen offered to put 500K. And then Cuban was going to put another 500K, and we have 1.5 million and keep going. But then AOL came, and they were like, hey, we want to put money in, we'll do it, or we want to buy 49%, we want to buy 51%. Then Ted Leonsis called me and said, listen, we want to buy your company. And I was a phone, on a phone call with Brian. We had maybe 150 k in revenue. And um, we had five employees, and then maybe three or 400 freelancers, some crazy amount of bloggers. And we're on the call, and Brian and I are Skyping back, and he's like, what should we ask for? And I said, what do you think? He said, 10 million. I said, I think maybe 20 million. Because we had raised money at a $3 million valuation from Cuban. So I said, maybe 20. He goes, no, no, don't ask for 20. We'll lose the deal. And so we're having this like dance bank off, and we're talking about, hey, what's the price going to be? What's the price going to be? And uh, I said, well, you know, what, what do you guys think? And they said, well, you know, we don't want to insult you or whatever. And 
you know, what would make you comfortable? And I just remember, like, somebody had said to me, always well, double it. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, we think 40 million would be the right number. So it's like, wow. On the phone, right. and my partner was like, "Are you fucking crazy?" He's like, "Over a Yahoo Messenger, like, are you crazy?" Yeah. And they said, "Well, we were thinking more like 25." And I was like, "Well, why don't we start with 30 and figure that out?" And then so we wound up selling for like 25 for the main asset, and then five million for Blogsmith later. So it wound up being a 30 million dollar sale. And uh, I remember sitting there with my wife, and I was like, uh, "And there was an earnout that we wound up getting, uh, so that was good too." Like, if we have millions of dollars, I wouldn't have to work again and we could buy a house. It was like a very surreal moment for a kid from Brooklyn. Um, and I sat there and I hit refresh on my Bank of America account. Hit refresh, hit refresh, hit refresh. Boom, the wire came through. And I just cried. Mm-hmm. My, my wife came in and she said, why are you crying? And I said, oh, my mom doesn't have to work anymore. My dad, mm-hmm. you know, my, my brothers. And it's just that... that I think that chapter of my life, that hustle, that there will be blood, I am going to destroy everybody, it was over at that point. Something inside you was validated. I, I think my fear was evaporated, really. Uh-huh. Like I, I realized I had lived with the fear of running out of money my whole life. I had lived with the fear of my parents, you know, every fight they ever had was about money. And watching my dad fail and watching my dad go six figures into debt with the government. Like, I was like, well, maybe my dad won't have to go to jail now because I could bail him out, you know, or whatever. So it was this very cathartic thing for me that I didn't have to be at war for the rest of my life, right? And at 30, it was good because I didn't actually, you know, 32, whatever it was, because I, you know, being at war is exhausting. And that kind of competitive motivation is very powerful. But it's not the most powerful. The most powerful motivation comes from within, right? And so to want to see something exist in the world, it's a slower burn, right? Or knowing you're doing the thing that you're great at, right? Like knowing you're great at something and you're deploying that skill in the world, that really is the ultimate. That's the ultimate flow experience. When you can dictate what you're going to do in the world and you can see the chessboard clearly Hmm. and you know you're going to win. You might not beat everybody, but you just know, like, I am fucking good at this game, and I will win. I will figure out a way to win. I have no fear anymore. So I think my fear evaporated from that point on. That's when I was able to just sort of transition to another level as an entrepreneur. And mm-hmm. just as a human being, too, because I, I just didn't have this fear chasing me that I was going to go broke. Well, Or to, to jail. <laughs> right. You, you were going to be okay no matter what, basically. Yeah. Precisely. So to, to That's why I'm a big advocate of people, when they do get that early sale, taking it or, you know, um, being able to sell some secondary shares and, and sort of, and if you look, like, we sold after 18 months, Denton went for 15 years. Right. I might have made more money than Denton at this point. I don't know how much he skimmed off of every year, probably some amount, but just in terms of cost of capital, like... He was at it for 15 years. I don't know, what. how much money is he going to wind up netting after all this? He's got to pay back $50 million to the investors, $50 million to Hulk Hogan. It was a $140 million sale. I think he'll probably make 10 or 20 or 30 maybe. I don't know. Mm. And then he'll get Gawker back, and then he'll be back in the game. Well, to start to bring this to a landing, I'm going to, with your permission, elide over some stories, your time sure. at AOL, Netscape.com, sure. that sort of thing. Because, again... I'm into the history. Sure. And we're in, in the era that I was active in. So Web 2.0, to me, started to feel like things were coming back with blogging, the rise of things like Friendster and things like that. But also... Flicker, the, delicious. The conferences. Yes. So Conference talk to me back. a little bit about that, about how important that was in terms of getting the band back together in terms of the tech yeah. industry. and. So... Um, I had a partnership for a couple of years with a guy named Mike Arrington, um, and we were pretty close friends for a while there, and he really looked at, he was obsessed with how Weblogs Inc. had sold to AOL, you know, which is exactly where he wound up selling, um, and he didn't know how to make money from the business tech crunch. And so we were smoking cigars, and we were at his place in Atherton, and I was going to do Mahalo, my new search engine company. Um, 
yeah, with Sequoia, and I said, listen, it's very simple. Just do conferences. Like, just break even on the journalist, but do conferences. You'll make a ton of money. He said, do it with me. And I said, ah, uh, I'm too busy, but, you know, I said, do it for me. What, what, what conference should I do? I said, well, you know, if you were smart, the conference you should do is in New York, I did something called Ready, Set, Pitch, which is a New York Times article about Ready, Set, Pitch from 1996, where I had people come up and pitch fictional companies to Ted Leonsis and other people. Um, and then people will actually put money into them. And it was way before Shark Tank. Like I, I, I came up with the idea. Because Halo was doing their greenhouse stuff at that time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I had been part of the greenhouse, and Ted Leonsis ran the greenhouse, and so you start to figure out the whole circle of how networks work. And then, so I said, what we should do is, I just acquired the domain name 20.com, which was going to be the name of Mahalo, but I liked Mahalo better. Um, and Mahalo tested better with women. So I said, we should just do like the top 20 companies, and we'll just do a one-day conference for 20 companies, new companies thing. We'll call it the 20 conference. And it will just, back to that rabble rouse of fighter, I was like, there's some injustice. And this again, back to like, you know, Mike is a, you know, a hard to like person, especially with all the personal problems he had, um, which people can look up online. Um, really horrible stuff. I'm very glad to have him out of my life. Um, he was a very hard person to defend having a friendship with. It's like kind of being friends with Trump, like hard. Um, and he, I said, the demo conference is charging $20,000 to present. It's complete, utter bullshit. Let's kill it. And so he just wrote a blog post. Jason and I are doing a conference. We're going to kill the demo conference because it's bullshit. All of a sudden, it became two days. We made a bunch of money. We did it for th maybe four, three or four years together. We made millions of dollars. That was, it became te TechCrunch 50? TechCrunch yeah. 50 yeah. eventually. Uh -huh. And then one day, he stopped returning my calls. And he said, um, and I had my daughter, who is now seven, so this was seven years ago, and, uh, or six years ago. And he said, um, I said, you're not returning my calls. What's going on? He said, meet me at Sundance, a uh, place on El Camino Real in uh, Atherton, Palo Alto, and we'll have a steak. We sat there, and he just looked at me like a robot and said, you know, I'm not going to do the conference with you anymore because I don't want to split the money with you. You can sue me, but I'm an attorney. I'll probably win, and I'll drag you through the mud, um, and I'll win the battle because I have the blog. And I looked at him and I said, Mike, uh, want to ask me what it's like to be a dad and my first child because you didn't call me when I had my kid. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, how's being a dad? And I said, go fuck yourself, and I will sue you. He said, if you don't like it, sue me. I said, okay, I'll sue you. And I walked out, and I sued him. And then he went so scorched earth, he called Marissa and yelled at Marissa on the phone. He called a bunch of venture capital firms, said, if you work with Jason, you never work with us. And Marissa called me and was like, Jason, listen, I know you and Mike are at war. And I said, I'm going to do my own conference launch. And Marissa and Google backed my conference. And they said, keep our 25K, take our name off of it. I cannot be at war with Mike Arrington. He's just insane. You know, like Mike was a scorched earth kind of guy. So I kind of met my match in him, you know, like in terms of somebody who's willing to go to the mat. And then I just, you know, I reflected on it. And somebody who's very wise said, you know, you jump in the mud with a pig. The pig enjoys it, and nobody can tell the difference. And I said, you know what? That's pretty good advice. So I dropped the lawsuit with him, and I just focused on launch. And I said, I'm just going to focus 100% of my energy on continuing this concept I had of giving free, letting people be for free. Then I'm going to give away free tickets and free tables, and I'll just run it out of break even. And sure, now we're six or seven years into the launch festival, and it's the largest event here in the United States. 15,000 people came last year. I do it at a break even, and I just build goodwill. And I got, you know, there's like a funny line in one of the. Um, Scorsese films where I think it's Mean Streets where the guy's like, this guy owes me 20 bucks, you know? And I probably rightfully deserved some percentage of the TechCrunch sale. You know, not all of it, but probably 20% of it or something because the majority of the revenue came from the events. Um, and so uh, the guy says in one of the Scorsese films, like, that guy owes you 20 bucks? Yeah, he's like, I'm trying to get that 200 bucks from that guy. He's like, that's the best $200 you've ever spent. You'd never have to see that guy again. And I realized, like, you know, not having Arrington in my life was this incredible gift. So even if he stole a couple million bucks from me from that loss, this would be great because then he had all these rape allegations and all this other stuff in his life. And who knows what the truth there is, but there were so many of them that I tend to believe the women in these situations. Um, and he ran and hid in Seattle or whatever. Um, and I just thought, God, it's so great to get Arrington out of my life because he's just such a dark person. And I knew he was a dark person right before all that stuff had hit because he had called a friend of mine and Kara Swisher's the C word. And I was like, Mike, you can't call a woman the C word. 
did you call our mutual friend, I won't say her name, the C word? And he said, Jason, she is a C word. I said, Mike, I, are you using it in the like, did you just get back from London or something and people are using that word in a different way than we use it here? He's like, no, she's a C word. I was like, Mike, I know you're Yankee Mike Chan, you're a provocateur, please do not behave this way. Don't call people these things because it's, it's bad for business, it's bad for you, it's bad for reputation. And Kara Swisher was like, he, he called her this, and I was like, he didn't. And then she takes out her Blackberry and she shows me an email from Mike calling this woman the C word. And I'm just like, oh my God. And, she, and Kara Swisher was like, how are you in business with this guy? Like, it's so bad for your reputation. That's when I was like, you know what? I got multiple people telling me not be in business with this guy. So I got out of business with him. But to your point, Web 2.0, which Arrington you know, and TechCrunch played a huge role in, you know, and Mike on his best day, leaving aside his horrible personal issues, and if they're true or not, um, you know, Mike on his best day was a great writer. He was candid. He was blunt. He was a great thinker. Um, and I like guys and gals who are, you know, debaters and sharp elbow. I love Nick Denton. If you tell me right now I can have lunch with Nick Denton, I'd be like, great. It's probably a few people I'd rather have lunch with. I, I like the guy. I like these kind of people. I like people who are got a little edge to them, right? Uh, um, but with Mike, you know, when the edge turns dark, you know, that's when you got to kind of like get those people out of your life. Um, it just got too dark. I want to end with a question about your angel investing generally, but I know you've spoken at length about this on this show. My listeners, though, haven't heard the story. Just briefly, the Tesla story and the, uh, the license plate, the number one Tesla license plate. Well, I became friends with Elon, and I'd say we're close friends. I mean, we, we have a really nice re relationship for a long time, um, and I won't get into that. But, um, but I will tell you things that are public. You know, like he, he struggled, as he's recounted in those early days of Tesla. In fact, you know, Tesla was created. He backed Tesla, but there were right. some other guys running it. We've had him on the show. Martin or? Uh, the other one. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so there, are, and they ran it into the ground, and mm -hmm. it was going to go out of business, and he had to take over. He, I don't think he really wanted to. He was busy with SpaceX. Um, but anyway, I wound up having the 16th Roadster. Um, and we became very good friends, and we went to dinner one night. And he's, he's actually told this story, so it's, I'm not speaking out of school. I never like to talk about it personal stuff. Um, it's much different than my earlier days, again, of trying to evolve as a human being. Um, and it was just like the rocket had blown up. Second rocket had blown up for SpaceX. And there was a story in Valleywag, back to Nick Denton, where they're just like, Tesla's got four weeks of money left and somebody was leaking the information. So I said, wow, tough week, huh? And it was during the financial crisis and we're having dinner in LA, just two of us having dinner. Uh, I said, what happens uh, if you blow up a third rocket? Said, That's the end of SpaceX, because I'm out of money. He was negative at that point. So I said, I can give you a couple million bucks. I mean, I don't have tens of millions of dollars, but a couple million bucks, I can give a couple million bucks. Like, don't worry about it, it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, and uh, he was trying to figure it out. And uh, I said, well, it's gotta be some good news. You know, what's going on? And he had personal problems going on, all kinds of stuff. And he said, well, I did get one good news. Don't, don't tell anybody about this, but um, and he started showing me the clay. And it was on his BlackBerry to just date the conversation. And he's showing me the Model S clays that he had a secret, he had a secret room down at SpaceX. And he had shown me the SpaceX facility when, before he bought it, like, or when he was buying it. It was just a big empty thing. He had like 20 people in the corner. Um, and in another corner, he had this like set up like a, a pipe and drape, and there was a clay model in there, and he showed me the pictures of it. It's gorgeous. It looks like it's cooler than the Maserati Quattroport or whatever that's called. It's like that Porsche Panamera is like kind of ugly. This is like gorgeous. How much is it going to be? And he said, I think I can make it for like around 50 or something, you know, after the tax breaks. I said, if you make that car for 50K, you will change the world. So I went home, I talked to my wife, and you know, it's like, poor Elon, like, he, he, and I said, how much is it true about Tesla? He said, no, it's not true that we have four weeks. I said, oh, great. He goes, we have two. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> it's brutal. So I wrote two checks for 50K, and I put them in an envelope. I wrote a handwritten note. Elon, looks like a great car. I'll take two. Folded it up and sent it to him. Didn't, he didn't cash it. Five, six months later, the checks get cashed. 
And then two or three years later, I get, congratulations, your signature model number 0001. Mm -hmm. Ding, your serial number 00073. And I said, oh, wow, you gave me those two. And I, so I immediately forked him. I said, dude, you don't have to give me number one. Like, it should be in the Smithsonian. He goes, no, no, I want you to have it. And so it was very, very nice, like, yeah. kind of thing. He's very loyal. You know, there's a lot of people who are, like, getting obsessed with him right now. And, you know, that happens in our industry. And, it, it, you know, you, you kind of ride it up and down. And, but he's one of the most down-to-earth, loyal, just normal people. And I think people project a lot into him and want him to be certain things. But he's, like, a funny great dad, good person, and like amongst the most loyal friends I've ever seen. Like just so loyal, like unbelievable to his friends. Um, and just a really good person at heart, you know, and I, I, very considerate. And people like, I've heard people say like, oh, he's a robot. And it's like the last word I would ever use to describe him was a robot. He's hilarious and fun and good person, right? Like, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I think, you know, you build up karma over a lifetime. I think and if you look at you know, I, at one point, Travis, somebody said something to Travis along the lines of like, Jason doesn't deserve a stake in Uber or something. Uh, and Travis said, oh no, you couldn't be more wrong. There's nobody who deserves to have been in the angel round of Uber more than Jason. And the person was like, why? You know, fuck Cal Canis or whatever. And I was there when they were saying it and it was like, um, do you know Jason held events for founders for the last 25 years? And I went to them, and he interviewed me at them when I had Red Swoosh, when I had Scour. And by the way, it's one of your events that the Uber raises its... Um, Seed round was Open right. Angel Forum. It was one of my little yeah. angel events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I believe in karma. I mm -hmm. believe people wind up where they're supposed to be because there's no way this kid from Brooklyn deserves where he's at, the station in life where I find myself. I know, I am super aware that I am the luckiest guy on the planet and that I'm like way above my pay grade. Like somehow I wound up in the NBA on an all-star team, like as the fifth man, you know, like yeah. point guard, maybe the sixth man off the bench, loved by everybody, but the team would have won anyway without him. I got lucky to be here, uh, and I, I realize it more than anybody, and you know, now I'm, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm so ahead of where I was supposed to be in life that I can really do interesting things, you know? I can really focus on what matters. I talked before about like, what is your motivation in this life, right? How do you find your motivation? I think when you're young, competition, being somebody, that fire in your belly is just awesome. But then at a certain point, you have to start to think about, well, when you do get that Bank of America wire transfer and you hit refresh and like, you don't have to worry about being poor or being broke again, um, which I always found it's very obnoxious when people say it's not about the money. And like, have you ever been poor and like had like debt and been hundreds of thousands in debt? Like, it is exactly about the money at that point. It's a very obnoxious, rich person thing to say. Like, oh, you know, I don't do this for the money. It's like, okay, then well, why is it not a nonprofit or a B corporation? Why do you have venture capitalists who all they care about is return on investment? Make no bones of mistake about it. Like, our industry is about the money. It's specifically about the money. That's why there's venture capital. Uh, and IPOs, but you're really finding out what you're good at, you know? That, man, that's the real deal. If you can figure out what you're good at in life and you can deploy it, that's where I am right now. I know I'm a good writer. I know I'm good at a conversation. So you use the Dylan analogy. So you had your acoustic period, you had yeah. your electric period. What are you, John Wesley Harding now, basement <laughs> tapes? Where are you? I think I'm kind of like, a probably Empire Burlesque, which might be the last good album, uh, you know, as far as most people are concerned. I, yeah. I see a lot of good stuff in Dylan. But, you know, maybe I am a road dog like Dylan. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, in, I'll be insignificant for the last 30 years of my career. Maybe there won't be another hit. But he found but I'll his... But I'll be out there playing and I'll love it. Right, because he found his thing, which is he just wants to do the work, the craft of going out and performing every night. That's it. Yeah. You know, like, so maybe I lose my voice, like, you know, and whatever, but I love what I do and mentoring and investing in companies, writing, doing podcasts. Like, I know what I'm good at. I'm good at communicating, doing this podcast thing. I'm good at writing and I'm good at investing. I got a good eye for it. And that's, the, that is like for all the people who are up and comers in your audience who are thinking about it, um, figuring out what you're good at and refining your skill. That's all that matters in this life. Like, if you have skills, and they're, they're giving all these young kids the false bill of goods. They're telling them like there's some patriarchy stopping you or matriarchy stopping you or this or just every, the world's against you and there's victimization. Like 
if you have skills and you have passion for something, you will never be a victim. They, you can only be a victim if they make you into one and you let them make you into one. You can hustle your way through this. It's done all the time. And that doesn't mean it's not easy and people want to call me, like Nick Denton had a great time. He got his revenge having Gawker call me a racist because I believe anybody can lift themselves up. I don't think it's racist to think that anybody can lift themselves up. I think that's American. I think that's like American ideal is that you can focus your skill, refine it, and just pour your heart and soul into something and become a successful individual. And you know, if I look back on my career, I think like when I see Rafit and Shenny and Will Leach and all these other folks, like I think they saw me going for it and were like, Jason's, I'm smarter than Jason. I have more talents than Jason. I could be more successful than Jason. I think I gave them this. The ultimate gift I gave them was a dumb kid being successful who, because I didn't care. I was like, I have nothing. I have to go for it. I have to accumulate some amount of worth in this world. And I just see these young kids, they come into it and they just, they don't want to acquire skills. They don't want to refine their skills. It is all about your skill writing, coding, design, and adding skills, whatever it is. If you have those skills, it is undeniable. You cannot be stopped. And that's how it was then. We were lucky to be there early, but we knew stuff. It's, just, it's the same way it is now. Zuckerberg, you know, you can deride him for, you know, never really making anything original other, you know, just copying Friendster pixel by pixel, you know, which is what he did. He just copied it pixel by pixel and put it on a better software platform. Um, you know, you can ride those people for that, but what you can say about him is he's a relentless executor. You know, the skill set that Zuckerberg had and his ability to just relentlessly execute, you have to admire. You have to admire that level of focus and skill. Just had that focus and skill. So for the kids listening, you know, uh, I think right now we're talking about this like an internet history. I kind of feel like the first 20 years of the internet is the first inning. I really think it's like a 100, 200 year story. So everybody's looking like, oh my God, you're the internet history podcast. Like you're really in the f maybe two innings in. We literally have four, we got another seven innings to play. That's why I'm so engaged. It's like Uber was not possible until smartphones and GPS. Well, Bezos has that day one building on the Amazon campus, you know. What's that? Because he says the internet, we're still in day one. For so, sure. So one of their buildings is called day one. It's literally that early. It's that early because we, you really have three or four times the number of people will be online in a very, you know, short period of time, 20 years or something. And virtual reality, and some of the stuff that's coming is just mind-blowing in terms of how it can change things. Well, Jason, I think that's a great natural place to end. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming on the Internet sure. History Podcast and, and just remembering all that great stuff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be interviewed for once. I do all the interviewing in this town. It's nice to be interviewed once in a while. Nobody invites me on their podcast. You're a decent subject. They should. <laughs> I'll take decent. All right. We'll see what happens when the uh, when the ratings come out for this episode. I predict this will be uh, top, top five. I'll take it. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, and my personal Twitter is at brianmcc. Thanks for listening.